This is the MAT 140 lecture number 17 on compound interest and there's an example, the third example here that I'll do that includes tax and inflation in the compound interest calculation. So probably if you're in Math 140 the basics of compound interest are hopefully familiar to you. This third example that I'll do in this video hopefully adds something kind of new and interesting to think about in this familiar uh, context of compound interest. So, but we'll start with this first uh, question and the second one that you see here as they provide a kind of warm-up uh, sort of orient what is it that I'm talking about and then I'll, I'll do a third one that includes taxes and inflation in the calculation. Alright, what I'll do here is I'll say that my future amount is based on some principal amount that grows according to some rate R that's divided by some frequency of compounding n raised to a power that is the frequency times the total number, the total amount of time. In the formula when I write it like this, a is the future amount, p is the present amount, also called the principal. That's principal with an al because it's just like the principal at the school, the first amount of money, so the principal is the first person in the administration at the school, and here we have the first initial starting amount of money is the principal amount. Now when I switch to writing it this way, R is actually always going to be an annual rate and N is the number of times in a year that you compound. And when I write the formula this way with this N and R that's divided by N and this T written this way, then, then T has to be in years, the R has to be the annual rate, and N has to be the number of times that you compound per year. Okay, so if we have it set up that way, in this particular example, we have an initial $1,000 principal. It's going to grow by 2% a year, but what's happening is it's compounded monthly. And so we're taking the 2% annual rate and dividing into 12 equal parts. So we're getting these monthly increases and n is the frequency here, so we're going to do that 12 times for a total of 10 years. Now for the most accurate answer, you want to type all that in the calculator at once. It gets a little awkward if you have um, a TI-36 or one of the smaller calculators to type all that in, particularly as we get to some of the other examples later when they have lots of different groups. Uh, but it, of course, you know, it didn't exactly say, but of course this is money, and in the context here it seems appropriate to get to the nearest penny. So to get it to the nearest penny, uh, type all of this into the calculator at once. Typing that on the calculator that I have here, it'll look like this. So if I'm going to round off to the nearest penny, it's $1,221.20 to the round of the nearest penny. Okay, hopefully that's all very straightforward. There's lots of other videos that demonstrate lots of examples like that available online. So let's move on to one other of this type. Uh, just switch just a, a little bit. Let's go to number two. This one says, how much must be invested now to achieve a balance of 5,000 in five years, assuming 3% interest compounded quarterly. Maybe I'll just take the opportunity in this example to show these different ways of writing this formula. Because we'll have to recognize this at some point. So the way I just wrote it is a very common way to write it, like this. And we know that P is the starting amount and A is the final amount. But there's a formula sheet that I've used with this class that I got from the Math 106 class. That I, I like that formula sheet. Use, it has some formulas that we'll use for annuities later in this class. And it organizes everything really well. But they do write the formula just slightly different. So in that other formula sheet, it's written this way. So we can go back and forth writing it either of these two ways. This has some value in, in distinguishing this P sub N is the amount after N years. P0 is the initial or principal amount. R is the annual rate. It has to be annual rate when you write it in this form. 
written this way, I'll use k as the frequency of the compounding per year, and I'll use n as the number of years. So it might be good now that we just sort of start to adopt this way of writing it because we're going to use a formula sheet as we move on to lecture 18 through 20 and on that formula sheet because we have annuities which are much more complicated formulas. On that formula sheet our compound interest formula is written this way instead of this way. These are, if you look at it carefully, exactly the same thing. We're just using different letter variables for those quantities. So moving things around a little bit there on the screen, um, I'll start writing my compound interest formula now using the formula in this form with these, these variable names. And looking at that formula sheet, I noticed that actually they use a capital N to represent the number of years. This is the finance formula sheet that I'm talking about. And I uh, use this for both the Math 106 and the Math 140. Both of those classes have chapters on finance. And it's because of these formulas on annuities that this is particularly useful. Simple interest is a very simple formula, and compound interest also very simple to deal with mathematically. But the annuity formula gets kind of complicated, and payout annuities and loan formulas, they are harder to memorize, and so the formula sheet's helpful. Uh, and on this formula sheet, we've got compound interest written this way. And I know there's another issue that does throw people off a little bit. You notice how the n and the k, the order is different here in this product of these two multiplied together. And of course, when you multiply values, it doesn't matter what order you multiply them. Right? So, so this is the formula that I'm going to be using right now in this next example. That p sub n is the balance in the account after n years. p0 is the starting balance of the account. That's called, it's also called the initial deposit or the principal amount. R is the annual interest rate in decimal form, and K is the number of compounding periods in a year. So here we are, number two. How much must be invested now to achieve a balance of 5,000 in five years, assuming 3% interest compounded quarterly? Right, and then there's another point to make about these different uh, frequencies of compounding in a, in a year. A useful table to use is this. You can see that if the compounding frequency is annually. The K that we'll use is 1. That's once a year. Quarterly is 4 times a year. Monthly is 12 times in a year. Weekly is 52 times in a year. And daily, you can use 360 or 365. It hardly ever makes any significant difference in the calculation whether you use 360, 365. It really depends uh, on just your preference. This is a common thing to do. 360, even though we all know First, you know, there's 365 days in a year. Even that is not precisely correct, right? Because it's sometimes 366 uh, for leap years. So neither of these is exactly accurate. And 360 is a nice whole round number that uh, represents a sort of standard 30 days uh, in a month and 12 months in a year. 12 times 30, that gives you 360. So 360 is usually what I'll actually use. Uh, and it really won't make a significant difference when you're compounding with that frequency, whether you use 360 or 365. Okay, so in this example, with quarterly compounding, that's a K of 4, and the question is, we want to achieve a balance of 5,000 in five years in the future. So let's start writing in our numbers here. 5,000, we don't know the starting amount, that's what we're solving for. It is 3% interest, so we need to put it in decimal percent, the percent sign we have to convert right to, to an actual number. Quarterly is four times in a year, four times in a year for a period of five years. Now, you can type all this in, write it down and round it off, and that's okay if you're showing the work, but to get the most accurate value, we can do the algebra first and then type that in. So what I mean is, in the calculator, let's type in 5,000 divided by all of this. I know that's 20. You could type it in, but uh, 4 times 5 is 20, and that's what I'll type in. So typing that in will look like this. I want to do 5,000 divide by, now in order to get all that in the, in the denominator, I'll use parentheses, 1 plus 0.03. 
3 divided by 4 raised to a 20 power. And rounding to the nearest penny, that's 0.95. So that's the answer for example two. Okay, so moving on to the third example. I think a pretty interesting example that involves taxes and inflation on with compound interest. So if you're in Math 140, I figure you're probably kind of familiar with these compound interest calculations, but this one you might not might not be familiar with, and it involves adding in the effects of taxes and inflation on the future value of a investment that is compounding and has compound growth. So uh, number number three, the formula V equals 100 times 1 plus 0 0.05 times 1 minus R all divided by 1 plus I raised to a power 10 represents the purchasing power of the future value of a single $100 investment after 10 years assuming a 5% annual growth rate with a tax rate given by R and an inflation rate given by I. So note that tax rate R is a value between 0 and 1. And it translates to if R is 0, that means the 0% uh, 0 tax rate. And if R is 1, that means a 100% tax rate. And what that really effectively means is that whatever growth is achieved by the return there, that 5% growth rate, 100% uh, tax would be all of that is tax. And so some fraction between 0 and 1 represents the fraction of the growth that's taxed. Also, inflation is also represented or interpreted as a percentage. I equals 0 means 0% 0 inflation. 1 would mean 100% inflation. And actually, you can go up higher than 100%, right? We can we will assume the tax rates the tax rate doesn't go over 100%. So you're not going to have negative growth as a result of taxes. However, the inflation rate could go higher than um, 100%, which would effectively cause uh, you know loss in the value of the uh, investment. So it says here by computing the purchasing power of the future value of an of investment we are calculating the future value of the investment measured in today's dollars. In other words, we're finding how much an investment will be worth in the future in terms of its purchasing power today. Now I'll go through some examples and really kind of try to illustrate what I really mean by that, but you know, the basics are we have this $100 investment that we're going to look at its future value in 10 years if it grows 5% every year, 5% growth rate on that investment over 10 years, it'll be worth more in the future. But if there's inflation and taxes, that cuts into this future value. And we're going to compare how the tax rate and the inflation in fact, uh, affect that future value. So question A, what is the future value in 10 years of $100 invested now with 5% annual growth, assuming no tax and no inflation? So copying the formula down here just so we can see it, we're going to calculate what's the future value if R is 0 and I is 0. So we have 1 plus 0.05, 1 minus 0 here, and 1 plus 0 in the denominator. Well, when we simplify that, you're going to, you're going to see that that's just 1 times 0 0.05. So this is 1 plus 0 0.05 divided by 1 raised to a power 10. So if there's no taxes and no inflation, we've just got that $100 increasing 5% every year for 10 years. And put it, putting that in a calculator, you're going to get 162.89. So the way you can interpret that is you could say, well, if you had invested $100, and it was just that one single investment of $100, and it just earns interest at 5%, that's a 5% growth rate annually for 10 years, the value of that investment 10 years from now will be $162.89. That's exactly what the checking account balance would say, or the investment balance would say. Uh, checking account's not going to give you 5%. So, so some investment that earns at a growth rate of 5%, it's going to say the value of this account is now $162.89, 
And basically that is the purchasing power measured in today's dollars. It would be worth $162 in today's dollars if you had that money. Let's take a look at the next part of the question, part B. What is the future value in 10 years of $100 invested now with 5% annual growth, assuming a tax rate of 20% and no inflation? So back to the formula again. The value will be this $100. We've got tax rate of 20%, so we've got 1 plus 0.05, 1 minus 0.20, everything over 1 plus 0 inflation and an exponent 10 because we're going to invest this for 10 years. So I'm just holding that value constant in these examples. So $100. This is 1 minus 0.20 so that's 0.80 so we have 1 plus 0 0.05, 0 0.8. You could interpret that as saying you're going to get 80% of the, of the growth because you have 20% uh, 20 tax rate. You still get the growth that that 5% return, you get growth from that 5% return, but not all of it. You get 80% of it. You lose 20% each year to taxes. So that's the way in which the tax rate is sort of figuring in. You're taxed on the growth at a rate of 20%. So that's, that's the interpretation of the tax rate. It's the fraction of the growth that is lost to tax. Right? So this is 80% of 0 0.05. That's going to give me 0 0.04. So what's happening is that's plus 0.04. So effectively we're getting 4% return actually because of that 20% tax on 5%. So this is $100, 1.04. So effectively 4% growth every year for 10 years. If you type that in, you get $148.02. So the investment balance is $148. Ten years later, you had invested $100 one single time. It grows at a 5% um, rate, but losing 1% one, uh, of that due to taxes, you're really growing at 4% rate for 10 years. It will be worth $148.02, and that's its purchasing power in 10 years measured in today's dollars. It would be like having 148 now, uh, but of course it takes 10 years to get there. Okay, so let's move on. And before I get to part C, let's just take our attention to this term that represents the inflation rate. And how does that really work? And then we'll look at an example. So imagine for a moment, suppose that the inflation was 100%, right? Just because that's an easy number to work with, 100% inflation, that would represent I equal to 100, right? Uh, I equal to 1. What would that do in this formula if the inflation was 100% and we had i equal to 1? What would it look like? So just thinking about that as an example, as just a, to illustrate. Let's leave everything else the same as it was. 5% growth, some tax rate. But if that was i equal to 1, we'd have 2 down here. And what would that do? So by doubling in the denominator here, we're actually dividing this uh, value by 2. And, and the way you could look at it is that 100% inflation means that prices are going up by 100% each year. And that means effectively the purchasing power of the same quantity of, of money is cut in half. And so with each year's increase of 100%, so this is an annual inflation rate of 100%, the purchasing power is being cut in half and it would happen each year for 10 years and that's why that 2 in the denominator basically cuts the future value of that investment in half with that 100% inflation. So now let's look at part C. What is the future value in 10 years of $100 invested now with 5% annual growth assuming there's no taxes but an inflation rate at 2%? So here again is my formula for that future value. We've got R equals 0 and I at 2%. Annual inflation means 0 0.02. So future value is the $100. 1 plus 0 0.05. And it'll just be 1 minus 0. So we'll just have 1 plus 0 0.05. In the denominator now, we have 1 plus 
0.02 for the inflation rate raised to a power 10. Now, you could type it all into the calculator at once, um, and that's the most accurate value. So actually, we should probably just do that. We're going to get $133.63. So that, okay, so that's a little bit lower than what we just saw in part, in part B, right? In part B, I had $148 with 20% tax, right? 20% tax dropped, dropped the value down to 148. Just a 2% inflation drops that value down to 133 from where it had been in part A, right? Part A is sort of the maximum value you could get. If you had no taxes and no inflation, just 5% growth every year, it would be 162. 20% tax brings it down to 148, but switch it to no tax, but just 2% inflation, and it drops down even further down to 133. So what we're saying really here is that even though the account would technically actually say that $162 that you would have had uh, by 5% growth, even though it technically says it's $162 value, its purchasing power measured in today's dollars is only 133 So its value has dropped down to $133 of purchasing power measured in today's dollars. It would only buy that $162 that you would actually have technically, numerically, would have a purchasing power of 133 today. Essentially what I'm saying is that even though it would technically be $162, because prices have gone up, that 162 essentially, because prices have gone up due to inflation, that 162 only has $133 worth of purchasing power. It would only buy what would be worth 133 today. So that's the correct answer, but it might be kind of illustrative it might be uh, help illustrate a little bit if we actually do this calculation in the parentheses here and just take a look at that. This is about 1.029 rounding off, right? So this is approximate. But if you just look at that value inside, you could say, well, in other words, it really means that even though you're getting a growth rate of 5%, because of the 2% inflation, effectively the account is really uh, growing at a rate of about 2.9% a year. Okay, we got one more example here, part D. What's the future value in 10 years? And really by actually saying what's the future value, it's really asking what's the purchasing power of that future value to be technical. So what's the purchasing power of the future value in 10 years of $100 invested now with 5% annual growth, assuming a 20% tax rate and an inflation rate of 4%. What happens here? This is our formula for calculating the purchasing power of that future value. We had a $100 investment that's going to grow at 5% with 20% tax, and we have 4% inflation over a fixed period of 10 years. So in the numerator, it actually... Now, you, of course, you could type it all in at once, but there's something kind of illustrative if you look at what's happening here. On the denominator, I have 1.04. Numerator, I have 1.04. So before you type it in, these guys are the same. They're going to cancel. It's equal to 1. And so the purchasing power of that future value is just exactly $100. So it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. So the account is growing at 5%. It's being taxed at 20%, so it's really effectively returning 4% a year, but inflation is exactly 4% a year. And so even if the account technically grows, uh, so even if the account is growing at 5% with 20% tax as we were looking at in Part B, and it's $148 future value, its purchasing power is $148, even though the account would say growing at 4% a year, it would say that it's worth $148.02 its purchasing power is exactly $100 because of inflation and how prices are going up. That 148 would have a purchasing power of $100 measured in today's dollars. So that was a case where the growth rate combined with the tax rate produces a 4% return that exactly matches the inflation rate.
So that $100 grows at a rate of 4%, but the inflation exactly keeps up with that, meaning that its purchasing power is, ex is still remaining at $100. And, and of course, the other way to look at that is that with 4% inflation, this 4% growth in the account is exactly matching inflation, exactly keeping up with inflation. So the account uh, is growing with that 4% return and technically numerically represents a larger amount of money. The purchasing power isn't changing. It's still worth $100 because prices going up with inflation are higher and those larger numerical values are still having the same purchasing power uh, with respect to uh, the prices of goods uh, with respect to the uh, what things cost. So we're just concluding that that 4% growth is just matching inflation and the purchasing power of the future value of that investment stays at $100. Now let me back up and just summarize uh, kind of an important point here in this example. We saw in part A that with no taxes and no inflation, the effect of the 5% growth every year was that the future value would be $162.89. And we saw that a 20% tax meant that the account was growing really effectively at 4%, and its future value would be 148 And we saw that just a 2% inflation really caused more decline in that purchasing power of the future value, right? The purchasing power of that future amount dropped significantly more down to 133 compared to 148. And in the last example, we just saw how it could work out that the growth rate and the inflation could sort of cancel each other out and the purchasing power of that future value is really the same as the original amount. One of the reasons why I'm doing this example is because it sort of illustrates how you can model the effects of taxes and inflation. And this particular model is something that I uh, will come back and do another video for the Calc 3 class because in that class we can actually look at changing taxes and changing rates of inflation and how they impact the purchasing power of these investments in the, in the future. And so that's one of the things that calculus can provide is this way to study changes in the value of R and changes in the value of I. But this is only, you know, fixed $100 and fixed 10 years, and I've already got two variables in here. So that's why it's in the Calc 3 classes, because it's got, you need to do multi-variable uh, derivatives, uh, partial derivatives with respect to R and I, and I'll plan, I'm planning to make a video on that particular topic sometime in the future but it doesn't fit into the Math 140 class. But it would be it's just sort of a point that you can see how calculus could provide some insight into really looking deeper into these effects of taxes and inflation, something that you maybe would have never thought about if you had just seen that it's a topic to study in, in this class. All right, so I think that's the end of this video. I hope it's been useful and helpful and interesting.